All right. Uh, good day. Welcome to today's presentation, ILM 310-302G, measurement solids level measurement. So this is a nice thin one, as we said earlier here, about 20 pages in the ILM, about 30 pages in this presentation, uh, and mostly factual and luckily not much math, I think no math. So straightforward uh, ILM here. Um, let's see what we got looking looking at us today okay today we're going to look at uh, describing the principles and applications of solid level instruments and then the installation requirements for said instruments so nothing really heavy today we are going to look at load cells which are a device that can provide continuous level measurement resistance tapes which also uh, do continuous level measurement. And then three, four, and five here, rotating paddle, uh, diaphragm switch, and vibrating fork switches, uh, all point level devices. So um, we've already covered uh, mounting and installation for point level devices and some different continuous uh, devices. So probably not gonna learn a whole bunch of new stuff there, um, but uh, we'll learn a little bit about each of these uh, devices applications and and so on okay so first off here we're going to look at uh, load cells and resistance tapes uh, load cells you may have had some uh, experience with uh, already um, truck scales things like that will use uh, load cells similar similar to this uh, resistance tapes are a, a completely different unique kind of measuring uh, device that I've never actually uh worked with myself in person um but an interesting kind of semi-primitive kind of technology with some unique applications that we'll look at okay so load cells uh, is a transducer which converts force into a measurable electrical output uh, there are many different varieties of load cells in terms of their in terms of their construction and the ion ilm used to list a whole bunch of different uh, configurations for load cells. I don't know if they do necessarily anymore, um, but in terms of operation, they're all basically the same. They're just uh, certain designs for certain specific applications. So load cells are based off of strain gauges, uh, which basically is the principle of uh, taking a, a thin piece of wire, uh, and when you apply force to it, uh, it gets longer and thinner. Uh, decreasing uh, the resistance and when the weight is off of it it gets shorter and thicker increasing the resistance and by measuring the change in resistance uh, we can uh, drive um, level out of it okay strange gauge uh, strain gauge load cells dominate the weighing industry they're probably the most uh, common device out there here's some of the different configurations you can see kind of a barrel shaped one here uh, we've kind of got this s shaped one here uh, and again, different applications. This one's basically for straight up and down measuring. Uh, this one over here that's in this S shape uh, has some provisions in it that can measure side loading uh, and things like that. But that's kind of once you become a strain gauge guru or a load cell guru, you'll and you can learn about those. Uh, strain gauge load cells offer accuracies from within 0.03% to about a quarter of a percent full scale. Uh, and they're suitable for almost all industrial applications, although they're really used for some relatively specific uh, industrial applications. So a pretty accurate little device. Okay, they, they measure resistance again, or changes in resistance between the load cells. Uh, and we can thank the English physicist, Sir Charles Wheatstone, who devised this marvelous uh, circuit here we call a Wheatstone bridge. And this is what we use to measure the change uh, in resistance that provides us uh, some type of a current or voltage um, that we use for indicating uh, level uh, when we're using uh, these, these strain gauges. Okay, there's a little bit of math uh, involved with load cells. And remember, we're, we're dealing with uh, level. This section is on level. So the idea here is we're using load cells uh, to give us level. So again, uh, this is the only little bit of math excuse me and it's not really tough uh, the height of the process can be determined by using the force balance principle which is a pretty fancy word uh, and some fancy equations but it's really not very tough at all uh, 
we use gravity just as we used before in any other level calculations. We use rho, uh, which is the density of the material. Uh, and in this case, the only other variable that's really different is the cross-sectional area of the container. Uh, and um, H is process height. So that's another variable that we used in previous uh, level calculations. So our PGH component here is basically the same. The only thing that's different now is we need to know the cross-sectional area of the container. And if we know the cross-sectional area uh, of the container and we know the height of the container, well, then we know the, we know the volume. Um, if we know the density, then we know we can then determine exactly what, what the height is based on that density uh, of that material. So the math itself is pretty straightforward. Um, I don't I don't uh, believe there's any math that is related to this in the ILM or otherwise, um, but that's how that's how they work basically. So they're they're using uh, weight in essence to determine determine height um, by using these these variables here. And again, the only thing difference is you, you need to know the uh, the cross sectional area of the of the vessel so that you can get the volume. Okay, marvelous stuff. Okay, strain gauges, like most resistance type devices, need to be temperature compensated. Uh, the fluid density must not change. And this is pretty critical. Um, if we're filling a vessel uh, and we're doing some math and we do the calculations to determine what the level is uh, at a given density, um, if that fluid were to become lighter, the level uh, would have to be higher to make the same reading. And if the uh, density was higher, the level would have to be uh, lower to reflect the same thing. So we have to be sure that the density uh, of the process medium that we're measuring for doesn't change or it's compensated for one way or another, whether you're using uh, a density transmitter in conjunction or whatever it might be. Okay, applications for load cells, most commonly used in tanks and hoppers. Uh, they're great for foaming products because the foam, there's nothing, uh, nothing interference wise, the, the load cells are usually at the bottom of a vessel. So whatever is going on inside that vessel is irrelevant. Uh, highly corrosive and non-contact applications. So again, completely non-contacting, right? We're just measuring a, a container of, of something. Uh, and as long as the container um, is um, suitable for that material, the load cell has absolutely nothing to do with it. Okay, viscous also falls in there, sticky processes. Again, uh, all great applications. We've looked at other devices that have issues with this. Uh, foaming, for example, ultrasonic doesn't like. Uh, sticky and viscous processes, we, we learned that capacitance doesn't necessarily like that much. Um, corrosive non-contacting, we looked at some devices that we can use for that. Um, load cells really are good at handling things that a lot of the other devices just don't like. So they do have their, they do have their place in the industry. How do we calibrate uh, a load cell? Pretty simple, if you've, used a, if you've used a scale, that's the process. So basically you zero out the vessel weight, uh, get a tear measurement, and then you'll add material to the lower range value, set your four, add material to the upper range value, set your 20. Uh, and that's ideally the best way you can do it. Um, you don't need to use two points or the, L or the URV, but it is best, of course, if you can. Um, and any two points should work as long as they are apart a little bit. So you can go 25%, uh, 50% and get those numbers. Um, because they're resistant, they should be relatively uh, linear. Okay, uh, second continuous device that we're looking at here is this uh, resistance tape. Um, which is a little bit unique. And I think the application that I normally uh, use here is like silos uh, and vessels that are, are kind of holding, uh, I don't know exactly what the great application is, but I, I always say silo, you know, like a grain silo on a farm or something like that would probably be a great application for a uh, resistance tape. And I don't think I've met anybody in class even that has uh, experience with these. So anyway, resistance tape is exactly like it sounds. It's it's tape-like, um, and it's got some wire wrapped around the conductor, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more here. So um, here's here's what it looks like kind of real life. Uh, it's got an outer jacket of some kind of plastic. 
It's got a gold contact strip in here built over top of a stainless steel base strip with some insulation around it. And then it's got some gold finished resistance wire around here. And I kind of make the relationship to it's kind of like a guitar where you push down on the frets here or the strings and they make contact with this gold contact strip. And as it does that, it essentially shorts out uh, the resistance of this wire, which is continuous from top to bottom. So the resistance of the wire from top to bottom is one large number. And if we short it out halfway between, then we have half of that resistance. Um, and that's basically the principle of operation. So um, in an application, again, a different, different diagram looks something like this. And you can see that the force applied by the process medium basically squishes the tape together, shorting it out and effectively reducing um, the length of the resistance wire here. So this circuit, initially when the vessel was empty, the signal would have to come all the way down to the bottom of the vessel, all the way up through all this resistance, and it would give us some kind of a measurement that was based on the resistance of the whole, whole length. Um, as it gets shorted out, it basically now the signal comes this way, to the short and then back up. So a much shorter uh, length of wire, thereby a lot less resistance, and they can use that difference in order to uh, determine where the level is. Characteristic that's important to note uh, with these tapes is something called actuation depth. And basically that is the amount of material that has to be um, pressing on the sides of the tape before it has enough force to actually push the contacts together. So you'll see, um, it's just like diving, right? You feel a little bit of pressure at the surface. The farther you go down, uh, you get down more atmospheres, there's more pressure. Um, so it's called actuation depth when we're dealing with these tape uh, tapes. And it's something that you have to, you have to consider when you're uh, determining your level. So you, you may get this resistance measurement. You might wanna say, well, this is where my level is. But the reality of it is, is your uh, level is a little bit higher because the pressure in the first few inches of the of the process doesn't have enough force to push the tape together. Um, so that's something that you need to be uh, mild, mildly aware of. Uh, so again, made from a base strip of stainless wrapped with uh, three sides of insulation and a gold contact strip, then gold finished wire winding like a guitar, sort of. Uh, if you can gain my brain. Uh, you can kind of you can kind of see that. Okay, so basically, uh, tape that when pressed together shorts out causes a reduced resistance relative to the level in the vessel, and as the level uh, increases, the resistance decreases because we are essentially shortening the length of this wire. These can be from one to thirty meters long, so. There's an application uh, there, uh, and this is kind of why I say silos, because that's the only thing I can think of that's going to be 30 meters tall. Um, but that's a good uh, application of, of the resistance tape. Okay, we can use these uh, for liquids or solids. We can use them for corrosive fluids. Uh, the tape is typically a Teflon or something that is, uh, uh, except uh, non non-reactive. Uh, so corrosive fluids don't necessarily have a problem with it. Uh, sticky, viscous, and foaming fluids, no problem there. Temperature compensation, again, will need to be taken into account. And that's really, uh, if you haven't caught on to this yet, a blanket statement that goes with any type of a resistive device uh, is going to have temperature compensation attached to it. And again, that has largely to do with the fact that resistance changes with a bunch of things, and temperature uh, is one of them. Okay, in uh, a special note here, I guess, in pressurized processes, uh, there needs to be a hole uh, or some other way to equalize the pressure inside the jacket. So they'll make a perforation in the, in the tape around, uh, around the, I guess the tape around the device so that when uh, the level goes down and it can expand and let those contacts release. And then as the vessel fills up again, uh, it, can, it can squish and there's not uh, anything trapped inside of it. Okay, and uses our wonderful friend, uh, the Wheatstone Bridge Circuit. And again, that is almost always tied to uh, resistance measurements. Calibration. Uh, again, not a lot you're going to be able to do here. They are linear devices, so every unit of length has a determined resistance from the manufacturer. 
So the lower range value and the upper range value can be calculated from those specifications that you get from the manufacturer, like X number of ohms per foot type of thing. Uh, and then you can apply that with a decade box. Um, or you can do the wet calibration like we've done before, where you actually uh, put process media into the uh, vessel at lower range value and set your four milliamps and then raise it to set your upper range value uh, and 20 milliamps. Again, don't forget, this has to be compensated for that actuation depth uh, again. So those are the two uh, continuous devices that we look at in terms of solid measurement. Um, the next three devices that we're going to look at are point level devices. Um, they include the rotating paddle, uh, diaphragm switch, and vibrating fork. And these are all relatively simple, straightforward devices. They act just like any type of uh, a switch or point level device, meaning that where they are mounted uh, is the trip point for the application that they're uh, intended to. Um, applications here, uh, as again with most switches, uh, overfill protection, limit detection, and different types of alarms, high level, low level, et cetera. So let's look at uh, individual devices for a little bit here now. So there's a rotating paddle. Uh, pretty straightforward here. Uh, this is the actual device here. It's got a paddle that rotates and it's an awful lot like an uh, egg beater. Um, if you've seen an egg beater in your life, I don't know. Okay, here's a cutaway. Uh, um, describe the uh, operation of it here. Slow moving motor operates the paddle uh, through a clutch and bevel gear. And although they don't really show that very well, but we have a motor in here. Uh, with a couple of gears that are connected and uh, this motor is turning all the time driving this gear which turns this paddle. The bevel gears are held in place by a spring so somewhere uh, in here there's a spring kind of pushing uh, pushing downwards in here and when the paddle contacts the process this paddle here uh, it causes increased torque which causes this shaft uh, to overcome the force of the spring that's pushing down, uh, pushes this shaft up, which contacts a micro switch here to indicate that a trip has been made. So fairly uh, primitive. Uh, those of you who are electricians, this is not very dissimilar from an overtorque switch um, on an electric motor. It's, it's actually quite similar. In installation here, again, because it's a point level detection device, wherever you put it is where it's going to work. We have different paddle blades used for different types of materials, and we don't get into the spe uh, specifics there, but uh, different ones for different materials. Uh, shaft bearing, something mentioned in the aisle, and uh, when you're working in dusty type applications here, best to have a sealed bearing uh, in order to protect uh, protect those bearings. So again, just like some of the other things that we, we've looked at uh, previously uh, in here, we don't mention the uh, angle of repose in this per particular uh, instrument here. Um, and again, they don't show a lot of stuff in this diagram, but of course you wouldn't want to mount these underneath the, the fill piping where the medium is going to be hammering on it all the time. Um, I think in the ILM they even say that you can uh, put a little baffle or something over top of it to avoid uh, having things smashing into it and so on. Um, so some of the standard installation uh, considerations that we've addressed in previous lectures would apply for these devices as well. Second device we're gonna look at here is the diaphragm switch. Uh, there's a picture of a diaphragm switch. Um, and it's again, relatively simple here. Uh, it's got a diaphragm on it, just like a valve actuator does attached to a shaft that moves back and forth in here and makes contact with a micro switch buried somewhere deep inside of it. And when the process medium level comes up, it applies force onto the diaphragm. The diaphragm pushes in and trips the switch, one way to do it. Um, they also have what's called a vibrating diaphragm, uh, where this diaphragm is vibrating at some type of frequency. Uh, when it's out of the medium, the frequency that it vibrates at is higher and when the process medium comes up and starts to cover it, that makes the frequency uh, go down. And it's kind of like being, uh, if you imagine yourself at the swimming pool and you're standing in the shallow end of the swimming pool and you wave your arms 
you know, like you're treading water uh, in the air and you can fly like a bird and you can move your arms really, really fast. Uh, and then if you squat down and put your arms in the water and you try to do the same thing, you'll see that you can't do it nearly as fast or your frequency is much slower. And that's the basic principle of operation of uh, diaphragm switch. Okay, calibration again. Uh, as this is a switch, there is no real calibration. Uh, the trip point is set by the mounting position. There may or may not, I'm going to assume that there's probably some type of uh, an adjustment in here in terms of spring tension uh, that you, you maybe adjust it to match the process medium, but it's not mentioned in the ILM, um, but something that you might want to look out for because I would suspect that they would have something like that. Okay. Um, Again, uh, because it's a switch, no calibration. Again, trip point is set by mounting position and then mounting position. Uh, again, make sure that it's uh, you're not in a spot that's gonna be problematic in any way uh, or in any uh, line of danger. Last but not least here, vibrating fork, very similar to the principle of operation of the vibrating diaphragm here. Uh, a coil vibrates the fork, and I think in the ILM it mentions it to be kind of like a tuning fork. Uh, and that's a great example, I guess. Um, most of us have seen a tuning fork. You hit the tuning fork on an object and it makes a sound. And then as soon as you touch it, the, the pitch changes, right? So it's basically the same kind of idea uh, with this vibrating fork device here. Coil vibrates the fork. And when in a process, the frequency of that vibration changes, usually getting lower, indicating the level location. Uh, the higher the density of the material, the lower the vibration frequency. Uh, and basically it's just detecting the change between the higher frequency when it's not in the process and the lower frequency when it is uh, in the process. Same setup as any other switch, uh, no calibrations per se uh, either. Installation here, we're going to look at, um, I guess this kind of applies, it looks like, to all the different devices that we've looked at. Um, but with specific uh, specific applications here to load cells because it really didn't talk too much about load cell uh, installation and of uh, the devices that we looked at today, they are far and away the most finicky. Um, I mean, this not not in a little bit, and this one is quite a bit finicky. Um, so there are some things we need to cover uh, specifically related to installation of load cells. So here they are, and you'll see they're all in orange. So they saved the best for last year. Uh, looking at the vessel here, again, we are trying to derive the level um, in this vessel by weighing it. So in order to do that accurately, accurately, we have to be weighing the vessel and only the vessel. Um, that's great if there's nothing connected to it. Maybe if I had a, a spout or a spigot uh, up here that wasn't connected to the vessel and it just dropped material straight into it. That would be great. That would be an ideal situation. There's no other forces that we have to worry about. Um, but the reality of it is, is lots of times you'll have um, a feed pipe uh, and a discharge pipe and the pipes are going to have hangers and things like that. So there are some things that we have to consider. Um, the vessels must be isolated from any other structure that may affect its weight. So we don't want this hanger to be pulling up on this pipe. Um, or pushing down or sideways or anything like that. Uh, we don't want any excess vibrations um, and we want to avoid any type of side loading. And side loading is exactly what it sounds like. Um, you know, uh, Cletus, the operator leaning against this vessel right here uh, is gonna add extra strain, uh, remove some strain from this side and add some strain to this side. So that's gonna change your, your measurement. Again, uh, having this hanger too short and this hanger too long could also mess things up. So setup is kind of important uh, with these here um, and some provisions have to be, have to be taken. So uh, flexible coupling is a good way to help alleviate some of the stress associated with piping. Um, vibration dampening and things like that uh, also may need to be uh, considered as well. Next, uh, resistance tapes, uh, not much to mention here. Um, again, this is a tape and we looked at guided wave radar uh, last week there um, and, you know, we got that cable style guided wave radar. We can't just have the cable flopping around inside of a vessel, uh, you know, to get caught up in the mixer or whatever it happens to be. Uh, this is basically the same idea here. Um, don't want it flopping around inside the vessel, so best to attach it to uh, the vessel wall or put it into a well 
or anchor it in some way, shape, or form. Rotating paddle, again, um, angle of repose rears its ugly head here. Uh, that is, again, the steepest slope before the product slides down, and they don't show it here uh, again. Um, but what they do uh, what they do show here is a couple of things here. There's that baffle I was talking about before. So again, if there was a feed pipe uh, in this vessel, I don't know why we're worried about it in this vessel because they can't fill it anyway. Uh, but in this vessel, for example, if there's a fill pipe up here, this baffle would protect uh, this funky rotating paddle. And you can see this one's a little different. It's just three springs uh, covered up. Uh, guard shaft, another option here that we have on this particular rotating paddle here. Uh, and again, I guess the idea here is to give this some rigidity so it doesn't uh, flex sideways. And a couple more different paddle styles here that we have. Okay, vibrating fork, again, same, same as far as uh, installation goes here. This is the big one, best diagram we've seen so far. Uh, don't want stuff filling on top of it, banging the heck out of it all day long. Uh, so put a baffle over top, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, one other thing specific with vibrating forks uh, is alignment. So you want to align the forks up so that they don't collect debris uh, and you want them to be also steep, uh, steeper than the angle of repos. And here's the diagram that comes in the ILM. Uh, typical forks are designed this way. They're not usually round. They're usually blade, uh, blade shaped like this. Uh, so this does apply uh, and you want your orientation when you install it to be correct so you don't end up with this uh, situation. And this is uh, helped out by the fact that you usually have an indexing mark on the housing here that tells you to, to mount it up so that you know the orientation of these fingers is good and is not going to collect any debris. And that is, uh, that is it. That's the end of solids uh, level measurement here. Why is that? Yeah, that's it, I guess. Marvelous. Well, that was short and sweet. The end.